Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's SANS Threat Analysis Rundown live stream. Really excited to have you all join us. I see we had a Jeff and Don who joined us already, nice and early. Folks around the world, thanks so much for joining. I'm Katie Nichols. I am an instructor for the SANS course Forensics 578 Cyber Threat Intelligence. And I'm not doing that. Also, Director of Intelligence Operations at Red Canary. And if you've joined us before, you know, sometimes it's just me talking about threat things. Um, and sometimes I have a guest. And I'm very, very fortunate this month to be joined uh, by a guest. Emmy Ty Cohen is the Attack Vector Intelligence Lead at Wiz, who does a ton of work in the cloud arena. And really excited to have Emmy Ty join today to talk through uh, something that's made a lot of headlines this Storm 558, which we'll talk about compromise of email accounts. And it's been something that has pretty significant implications, but I don't think a lot of people understood it. So Amy Tai published a blog post with his team earlier this month, asked him to join. And so Amy Tai, thanks so much. Welcome. I'd love to have you uh, greet the audience and tell them a little bit about your background. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Um, so my name is Amy Tai. Uh, I'm based in Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, I work in Wiz, which is a cloud security company. Um, that's where I lead uh, a team called Attack Vector Intelligence. Um, our team is basically in charge of making sure that customers are protected from emerging threats uh, to their cloud environments. And to do that, we research how threat actors are gaining access to cloud environments, what sort of lateral movement they're doing, what are they going after, what sort of tools they're using. Uh, we help customers inv investigate uh, incidents, do incident response. Um, and most of our work is spent translating our research conclusions into all sorts of improvements that we can make uh, to protective and detective controls. Um, sometimes that means adding a new rule by working with the detection engineers. Uh, sometimes it means working with our PMs and dev teams to build new features into the product. Uh, so we do a bit of everything. Nice. And your team releases a lot of research publicly, which is how I'm super familiar with Wiz. There are honestly not a ton of teams right now who are doing so much research into what threats are doing in cloud environments. Um, and as we've talked about in previous streams, kind of an important area. So really excited to have you here and bring all of your, all of your knowledge. And I am sure I will learn a few things from you as well. Um, so diving in, our topic for today is Storm 558. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, this is a group named by Microsoft. Um, and this blog post came out in July, and we'll kind of talk through Amy Tynes' team's analysis and some of the updates. But to kind of start from the beginning, Storm 558, um, you might know that uh, Microsoft switched to weather-related names. So Storm 558, China-based threat actor, espionage objectives. And this blog post in July talks about how this adversary used forged authentication tokens to access a bunch of email accounts, right? Orgs include government agencies. So you might recall hearing about this a couple months ago, right? So some information was uh, in this blog post in July. Then the investigation continued as we'll discuss. So, right, Storm 558, China-based threat actor. Um, we know that there are lots of names for these groups. So overlapping um, with APT31, uh, old name Zirconium, overlapping with Violet Typhoon, another Microsoft group, but so, sort of distinct. Um, and you can read through this blog post, which we dropped a link to in the chat. Um, we can always look at working hours of the actors. That's kind of interesting. I can't say, well, these are working hours in China, so we know it's a Chinese actor, but one piece that I'm sure Microsoft used in making that uh, assessment that they're China-based. And in thinking about who should care about this group, as we'll talk about their activity today, right? Thinking they've targeted US, European diplomatic, economic, governing bodies, um, any individuals who are associated to Taiwan, Uyghur geopolitical interests, also other targeting media companies, think tanks, telecoms, service providers. And so they have, right, an espionage motivation. But if you're any of those uh, sectors in particular, this might be an actor that you, uh, that you should pay attention to. So with that kind of knowledge of the actor, again, read about them a little bit more. Amy Ty, I'd love to have you kind of walk through, and I know you uh, shared this awesome graphic that you created yourself on uh, Twitter, and we'll share a link to that for our audience as well. Uh, could you kind of walk us through what, what happened in this email compromise? Okay, so 
uh, as you mentioned, I, I wrote up this, uh, this graphic. Uh, the reason I did so is just because I find that it helps me sort of understand stuff myself uh, as I'm reading. Um, it's often like the first thing I'll do. I'll just start highlighting uh, different parts of a blog post and sort of try to figure out visually uh, what actually happened there. Uh, Microsoft's original blog post, I think, is understandable for people who are uh, very knowledgeable of Azure and Azure AD. Um, but for a lot of people, I'm guessing uh, that a lot of the stuff they talked about doesn't really mean much. Um, they didn't explain all the technical terms uh, for um, a wider audience. Um, so my team, along with our vulnerability research team, uh, started to look into this and try, sort of tried to, to parse what they were talking about and what this threat actor was actually doing. Um, we don't have an internal understanding of how Exchange and Outlook are set up. Uh, so we had to sort of figure stuff out from the documentation, um, ask people who are more familiar with the, with how the, uh, how those applications are actually working. Um, and this diagram is sort of a summary of, of our understanding based on this and based on consulting with a bunch of people who were, who were also looking at this at the time. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, Storm 0558, according to Microsoft, gained access to what's known as an MSA consumer uh, signing key. Um, and they use this, and I'll explain in a minute what that actually means, but they used it, bottom line, uh, to steal emails from uh, government exchange online accounts. Basically, uh, high-ranking American uh, diplomats, people uh, all over the American government, about 25 organizations in all, uh, which is, depending on how you look at it, it might be considered highly targeted, it might be considered a pretty large, a large operation, depending on how many people were actually uh, targeted within the organizations. Um, but I will say that considering the power of an MSA consumer signing key, this was definitely considered, like we can definitely consider this to be targeted. Like assuming the Chinese threat actor knew what they had and what they could do with this, they could have done way more damage. At least that's our understanding based on our understanding of Azure AD and what uh, Microsoft uh, concluded from their investigation. Um, so with an MSA consumer signing key, um, the attacker was in a position to forge authentication tokens. Uh, basically, this is the key that Microsoft uses in order to, when you want to sign into your, for example, Outlook.com account, um, this is the key that they use to sign uh, your access tokens. And then you submit those access tokens to Outlook. It's a, it compares um, uh, the key to what it knows to be trusted keys and says, OK, you're all good. I'll let you into Outlook.com. Um, so the authentication token is really, that's how you gain access to Outlook, yes, right? right? And I think this is something that, you know, as you said, when someone might have read that initial blog post, if you don't have a deep understanding of how Outlook works, right, just even getting used to these terms, okay, access token, right? That gives you access. So that makes sense. Yeah, but MSA, for example, um, which actually... It, it, I can't remember exactly what, what that stands for, but uh, bottom line, I think it's like Microsoft account or something. Uh, yeah. But basically it means um, uh, Microsoft, when you sign into a Microsoft application or when you sign into an application using, for example, login with Microsoft, or if you sign into an application that is hosted on Azure and using uh, Azure AD as its identity provider, um, you are essentially dealing with an MSA consumer signing key. Uh, that is what is signing your tokens when you are using a Microsoft account. For example, my home uh, Windows computer, when I sign when I sign in for the first time and when I use anything on there that connects to the internet, I'm essentially uh, validating my access key using an MSA consumer signing key on the Microsoft side of the aisle. Um, so the first thing that we noticed here that was a bit confusing and, and we had took a while to figure out is that Microsoft had said that this was an MSA consumer signing key. So how did the attacker manage to exfiltrate emails from enterprise accounts? Because people in the US government aren't using personal accounts for the emails they're using, they're using their, their enterprise accounts. And what Microsoft said without going into too much detail on their blog post was that there was a bug uh, in the way that um, uh, Exchange was validating tokens. So basically, it was accepting tokens that were being signed by the wrong key which wouldn't be an issue unless that key was stolen. Because it's not like it's trusting any key, it's trusting just a wider scope of Microsoft keys than it should be trusting. So you have these two separate worlds of the enterprise and the consumer side, and for some reason, Exchange was trusting 
uh, keys signed by everything. So this made the MSA consumer signing key, which was already quite powerful because it allowed access to all consumer accounts um, to also be able to access enterprise accounts under certain conditions. So this got us wondering. This got yeah, us wondering. I wasn't aware of the kind right. of consumer versus enterprise difference. And so like any type of MSA signing key, it sounds like like it it can do a lot, right? It's It's a trusted key from Microsoft. But the distinction here, the consumer signing key was actually being trusted by enterprise logins, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, which, which, which was very strange and that shouldn't happen, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we tried to figure out what this key actually was and okay. what might have caused that bug. Um, and the more we looked into this, um, the more we realized that how powerful this key actually was uh, and the level of damage that the threat actor could theoretically done. Uh, there was also another uh, vulnerability in uh, in exchange um, that is a bit less interesting, um, but it basically allowed the the threat actor to sort of um, maintain persistence to emails uh, email accounts once they had gained access uh, mm -hmm. due to a vulnerability in the way that tokens were being renewed. So basically, they could exchange an existing token for a new token, uh, so they didn't have to keep um, uh, validating their own tokens against against the server. Uh, but gotcha. that's like the less interesting part. That's more like a, an application side vulnerability that is probably unique to to exchange. I see that down here at the bottom. So sort of a more of a persistence thing. Like the real concern is that they can gain access, but once they're in, just making it easier to maintain that access. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that helps. Um, and then you know one of the kind of gaps here, and I remember when this came out in July, and everyone started chatting, and your team published a blog post. Like, where did this? How did this? key gets stolen, right? And that was sort of the unknown piece from that Microsoft blog post, right? Exactly. And they they were very careful with how they were phrasing it because I think at the time they they had no idea how this happened. Um, so we were also very careful in how we were phrasing it because I kept, I remember I kept thinking of it as, you know, the key was compromised, but calling it compromised has a certain connotation of, of the threat actor actually holding the key in their hands, stealing it from somewhere but it's possible like there were so many options like it was possible that they had gained access to something that indirectly was allowing them to sign keys so perhaps mm -hmm. they didn't actually have access to the key itself perhaps they just had access to a system that had access to the key so microsoft kept calling it the acquired key uh, so we adopted their 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 terminology as well um mm -hmm. uh, yeah but there was a, there was a huge mystery around this um and i think that that's that's why we're talking today because Microsoft has uh, has revealed a few more details. Yeah, and you know, I think throughout this conversation, like giving credit, like I can only imagine the investigation that has been going on for Microsoft in months, and they're really, really tough, I'm sure. So July, and you know, we all have gaps in our investigations. That was a big gap. Um, so interesting question coming in from uh, Salman: Why are Exchange the most type targeted type of servers? Um, Amita, I'm curious if you have any input on why are they most targeted? So there are two types of, like, there are many types of exchange server, but there are two main types of exchange server. You have the on-prem exchange offering, and you have the Office 365 offering, or like the online version. Um, the online version is considered more secure in general just because it's constantly being updated uh, by Microsoft. So you don't have to patch it yourself. Um, a lot of the recent cases of exchange being targeted by threat actors has actually been the on-prem version uh, because people aren't patching them fast enough. Um, patching is something that's on the, on the on the customer's side of the shared responsibility when it comes to, to on-prem exchange. Um, exchange is incredibly popular among enterprises. It contains very, very interesting information for threat actors. So they spend a lot of time and money uh, and, and, and personnel uh, to find zero days uh, in exchange. Um, so that goes on for a while. And even afterwards, as I mentioned, people aren't patching fast enough, so they become end days. And then they're exploited for a while until until the patching cycle sort of calms down and, and people patch enough. Yeah, I think a couple great points there to reiterate, right? Like adversaries target whatever people are using. And exchange is very widely used. And I appreciate you calling out the on-prem versus online um, I can't, can't remember if it was 2020, 2021, whatever March that was, where there was a really bad exchange vulnerability in on-prem servers. And there have been, you know, as you noted, several, you know, on-prem exchange vulnerabilities 
over the years. And one of the recommendations is often just move online, right? Microsoft hosts it for you. And people have seen that as sort of a silver bullet. And I think what's interesting about this case is like not a silver bullet, like there are vulnerabilities, whether it's on-prem or hosted in the cloud. So I think that's an interesting nuance of, you know, maybe it's less risky potentially in the cloud, but there are still ways that adversaries are being creative and getting access to hosted Outlook as well. I think it, it, it's almost, this is probably a bad analogy, but it's almost comparable to saying that flight, flight is still the safest way to travel, right? It's just that when you do have a plane crash, then it's kind of catastrophic. It's safer than driving, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is. It's There's stats there, but then a plane crash and you're like, oh, flying isn't perfectly safe either. So I'm flying next week and now I'm going to be thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. So, all right. This was July. So I think we, right, there was this acquired MSA consumer signing key. Basically, let these actors get access to targeted 25 organizations, um, right? Two different vulnerabilities we talked about. and then. The Microsoft investigation continued, right? And that's where um, in September, right? And I will see, look at my tabs here. Uh, the Microsoft team uh, actually published another blog, right? Early September um, with updates on their investigation, which again, you know, credit to folks at Microsoft who are, I'm sure, doing their best as they can. And so your team, again, I think, you know, you can read this if you understand the details of how right? Exchange online, outlook.com, OWA work. But I think what I appreciated about the blog that you and your team wrote was kind of breaking down the findings. So, right, uh, pivoting to kind of your blog post, what changed from July to September in Microsoft's investigation? So the main difference uh, compared to July was that they developed a theory for how the key was actually acquired. Um, it is worth mentioning that this is still a theory. Um, a lot of the data points here are proven, but the most important one, which is the, how they actually got access to the key is still only a theory. Microsoft mm -hmm. to clarify that this is just the most likely theory they've come up with until now. Um, and I have to say that like my opinion on, on this is that it definitely seems um, uh, possible like they're, the science is solid behind what they're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely shows that the attacker had to go through many, many, many hoops in order to get this information. But it is still possible that this isn't actually what happened. Like it's possible that there's another method by which the key was leaked. Um, and, you know, it's possible that it involved some of the steps described here, but it, you know, we, st we still don't know. And to be honest, we probably will never know because it happened quite a while ago. Uh, their current theory is that it happened anywhere between two years ago and uh, May or about May, April, I think. Um, so we might never know. Like logs often don't don't go back that much in time. Um, so, and I think Microsoft by publishing their blog post have said that they've, they've probably exhausted all their resources and all their evidence that they could have looked over up until now. Otherwise they wouldn't have, have made their blog post. Uh, so yeah, I think, and I, think I appreciate you calling out the, you know, likely and possible, you know, in intelligence analysis, we use those words of uncertainty as well. And I mean, that's the reality when you're doing an investigation like this. Um, I'm kind of amazed that they had any logs to even try to investigate back to 2021. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's, I appreciate you calling that out that this is possible, but not not known so it's kind of interesting that that might be one of those things that we as a community and microsoft just don't know for certain how that signing key was acquired that's that's interesting yeah unless i guess i don't know maybe one day the the chinese will do a, a documentary and behind the scenes on how they <laughs> build the microsoft key I don't know. maybe in a couple decades yeah someone on their deathbed or yeah that'd be interesting we'll have to keep an eye out for that in the future so um, what is the current hypothesis um, kind of starting on the right here, uh, you know, possible, can you explain to us kind of the one theory of how the signing key might have been acquired? So Microsoft have came, have come to the conclusion that uh, the most likely theory is this. Um, around April 2021, um, a signing system that had access to this specific MSA signing key uh, crashed. Um, they haven't said why it crashed, 
it's possible that it crashes all the time. It's possible that it was just a routine crash. Uh, there have been theories going around uh, that the reason it crashed was because that specific key expired in April 2021. Uh, so maybe the expiry caused it to crash, but I don't think there's any evidence of that, and Microsoft haven't said that it's true. Um, but for whatever reason, it crashed. Now, um, Microsoft, uh, being a serious company, uh, has systems in place that make sure that crash dumps are scanned to make sure that they don't contain anything they're not supposed to, uh, because mm -hmm. crash dumps are incredibly valuable for threat actors because they contain things that are often uh, decrypted because they're in memory. Um, they they often contain information like credentials. They contain some stuff that if you're a threat actor, you're going to go after this. Um, but for some reason, there was a race condition bug. Uh, that's what they've described it as in their blog post that caused the signing key to be included in the crash dump. It's interesting. So I'm imagining, you know, like my Windows machine blue screens, and then you look at those dump logs as, you know, a user. I'm just imagining the, I don't know, how advanced an actor would have had to be. Also in 2021, I feel like, Many people in security community were just looking at like the entire, you know, Office 365 and Outlook ecosystem and like to know what they were looking at in April 2021. Like we talk about advanced persistent threats like that. That's kind of impressive. Like if that's how they got it, like you have to sometimes give credit to the actors for finding that. Yeah, I think I mean, when we talk about like the level that we should expect in terms of security of uh, cloud providers. I think if a, if an, a threat actor needs like more than two or three zero days or the equivalent in terms of like lateral movement and breaking through security boundaries in order to get what they're after, it's very hard to blame the vendor because yeah. Yeah. you're going to have zero days and you're going to like, you can't air gap everything. Um, and, and yeah, like if, if this is how they got it, then, then kudos to them and, and yeah. well done. Um, and it also, one of the things that we we wondered is, were, was this even what they were after? Like, did they have an understanding that the crash dump was likely to contain um, cryptographic material, or maybe they were after something else? Um, and I think that's also something we'll probably never really know because trying to decipher actor intent uh, in retrospect is is sort of difficult because you only know what they succeeded to do. Absolutely. Why why do humans do what they do? Like. Pretty challenging assessment to make. To yeah, that's interesting. And like, are they trying to listen to this crash dump? Do, are, is this group, have they been looking at crash dumps for years? And to me, that just opens like, I don't know, a lot of things that would keep me up at night. Like, what else have they gotten from these crash dumps that we might have no idea about? So we're not going to think about that because I need to sleep tonight. But it's yeah, interesting. It was two years ago. So, so yeah. who knows? Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, like as we follow this uh, from right to left again, mm -hmm. um, this dump was at some point, uh, Microsoft hasn't been incredibly clear on the timeline, but sometime after April 2021, it was transferred to Microsoft's corporate network um, to a debugging environment, probably for an engineer to look at the crash dump and figure out what went wrong so they could fix the signing system and prevent it from happening again. Um, and again, Microsoft is a serious company, so they have scanning systems in place to make sure that crash dumps in the corporate network also don't contain any sense of information, but that failed for some reason as well. Um, it was looking for credentials, but it it didn't identify this as something that, that should have been scrubbed. Um, and for some reason, this crash dump persisted in the debugging environment probably for a while. Again, we don't know how long. It might have been uh, early 2023. It might have been immediately after the dump happened. Um, so now we go back to the left side of the diagram, which shows what the attacker actually did. Mm -hmm. So at some point again, after April 2021, um, this threat actor managed to compromise a Microsoft engineer. Um, they managed to steal mm -hmm. an access token to their account within Microsoft. And then they logged in as impersonating that engineer. And this is what we, th these are the facts. This is what we know happened. Mm -hmm. And from this point, it becomes conjecture because Microsoft has said that this engineer had access to this debugging environment, like he had permissions. And it's possible that we don't know who this is, we don't know what their role is. Maybe they've also reached the conclusion that this is something that he or, or she happened to do on their day-to-day -day basis. Like maybe it was likely that they were accessing mm -hmm. the debugging environment on a regular basis. They don't have logs going back uh, for this specific action, but 
since they know that Storm0558 had access to this engineer account, and this engineer account had access to the debugging environment that contained the crash dump, they've okay. concluded that this is the most likely vector by which they stole the signing key. Seems logical. That's interesting. So yeah, actor compromise Microsoft engineer account, which makes sense if you're you know trying to look for a juicy target, like engineers access to all kinds of code, and then they likely figured out, okay, they access this debugging environment. If I were an actor, you know, risk of near imaging here, but I would be like, what is in there, right? Maybe investigating, finding that dump, right? That crash dump, and then, right, acquiring that key. Again, this is all possible, likely, the most likely scenario. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. So that kind of answered the gap, right, from July publication, where the key was acquired, not certain, but it seems likely the key was acquired through the actor, right? Compromising this engineer's account and then gaining access to that crash dump in that debugging environment. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. I honestly, like before this, I was I was kind of confused. Like uh, Jeffrey commenting, like, this is beyond me. I'm glad we have smart people looking at this. Like. Jeffrey, you can understand, right? I think this diagram is really helpful because break down the different parts. Like, what do we know? What's likely? But, right, in thinking about the implications here. So we talked about how, right, in July, right, we know in the summary showed, okay, um, allowed access, unauthorized access to at least 25 target organizations. I guess the big question here is what else could have happened um, with, right, this uh, Storm 558 having this signing key? Yeah, so there are a few questions, like if we go back in time to when they did this, first of all, we don't know what else they did. It's possible they had access to other engineers. It's possible that this, this crash dump contained other information. Maybe there's more crash dumps, but that's all conjecture. Like we have no idea. It's possible that Microsoft have definitively proven that the threat actor didn't do anything else or they don't have enough evidence or anything to to make them think that that would be likely. So let's just assume that this is all that happened uh, and the signing key was all this threat actor took. Mm -hmm. Now, a few more things to consider here, uh, and this is something we actually touched on on our, on our, on our first blog post uh, covering um, the July uh, account of, of what happened in Microsoft. Um, so yeah, so this is a blog post that, um, that I wrote uh, together with uh, Sheer Bors, our uh, head of vulnerability research uh, uh, at Wiz. Um, they do a bunch of other stuff, like all the, the cool blog posts that you mentioned before. A lot of that is their work where they, nice. they basically discover crazy vulnerabilities and crazy ways to access information like cross tenant, uh, vulnerabilities within cloud services. Um, a few days ago, they published, um, a thing about, uh, SAS tokens being misconfigured, uh, which is another uh, data sharing feature in Azure, um, and how that exposed a bunch of data that shouldn't have been exposed. Um, uh, anyway. Um, so we, we basically did like an analysis of Microsoft's original blog post and we tried to figure out what the MSA signing key was and what it was capable of. Uh, so if you go down a bit to, uh, I think around the middle, um, I'll tell you where to stop a bit more that there, that, uh, screenshot. This one. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, when you register an application in Azure uh, to use uh, Azure AD as your identity provider, uh, you are faced with the following choice. Um, you decide what sort of accounts can access your application. So you can either choose to be single tenant, meaning that only accounts in your organization can use this application. For example, if it's an internal app, you can choose to allow uh, or accounts in any uh, Azure AD directory to use this so that you can share it with other enterprise ac accounts, meaning that it becomes sort of like a, a B2B application. Um, or you can do what's known as mixed audience, where you allow both enterprise and consumer accounts to connect to your application or only consumer. Um, and what I marked here in red is basically the scope of what this signing key had access to. Um, basically, it would have allowed you to impersonate an account as long as you knew that, that someone was using an application um, if the application was defined as mixed audience or as personal accounts on, only i.e a consumer account um, and this affects a great many things microsoft have said that they only have evidence that the threat actor accessed exchange and outlook mm -hmm. but 
There are other Microsoft applications that are also defined as mixed audience, for example, SharePoint, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Skype. Um, you also have many consumer uh, applications like Xbox, for example. Um, so mixed audience refers to enterprise and consumer. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. So for example, like I could use a, I could have a personal like outlook.com, what's what used to be called Hotmail mm -hmm. account, but I could just as easily have an Outlook account in at Wiz, for instance. Sure. And both are using the same front end in terms of what Outlook is. It's just a different authentication mechanism. Um, yep. And in addition to all those Microsoft applications, which were, were, were also in theory within the attacker's grasp, just by having the signing key, Microsoft customers that were using Microsoft Azure AD as their identity provider, if they if their applications were defined as mixed audience or consumer, then the attacker could have, in theory, also targeted them because they were trusting the same consumer key. Now, uh, the interesting part is that, um, as I mentioned in the in the first diagram, Microsoft had said that um, Exchange had a bug that caused it to trust caused it to trust uh, the consumer token for signing enterprise access keys, mm -hmm. and we had uh, theorized that this was because they were either using the wrong um, trusted uh, list of trusted keys, which is one option. Because mm -hmm. if you're using the wrong the wrong list of trusted keys, then obviously you're gonna you're gonna be trusting the wrong keys. Mm -hmm. um, and another option was that they might not they might have been using the right endpoint, the right trusted keys, but they weren't differentiating between keys signed by uh, tokens signed by each key. And the reason we thought this was likely is that when we looked into this, we realized that the Azure AD SDK, um, which is what Microsoft offers their their customers as a tool to help them develop applications that that want to use Microsoft Azure AD as their identity provider. So this SDK, up until this was published in July, didn't have uh, that differentiation built in. So if you were developing an app and you wanted to use Azure AD as your IDP, as your identity provider, mm -hmm. unless you were familiar, highly familiar with the documentation, and knew that you had to implement this yourself, um, you would have had this, but the same bug. Interesting. So SDK basically like it didn't have this concept where in SDK you could say, "I want to trust enterprise or consumers." It was just unless you knew like how to configure it on the back end somehow, like you couldn't yeah. trust that. Like the, it, it mainly affected the the third option here, where it's where it's multi audience. Because mm -hmm. that would be the place where you might make mistakes. Because you're basically saying anyone who is either a consumer or an, or an enterprise account can log into my app, mm -hmm. and I it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm that I'm properly checking if their key is expired, who they who they are, who uh, if this key is if this key, if this uh, token has been signed by the right key. And if I don't implement that implement that myself, then I'm going to make a mistake. Um, and following this, since it's such an easy mistake to make, and it wasn't because it wasn't in the SDK, then Microsoft actually fixed the SDK and included this, uh, this functionality. Gotcha. So as you're talking through this, I'm thinking, OK, like it, Microsoft has said that they only have evidence of Outlook being affected. But in the like potential scope, and I have to imagine you have this listed as a gap somewhere, like is it possible that the actor could have had access to like personal Microsoft accounts, Skype, Xbox, back to 2021? Is that sort of the like possible scope? Again, there's no evidence of that, but is that like in the realm of possibility? So um, um, that's a good question. So for mm -hmm. Skype and Xbox, because that belongs to Microsoft, Microsoft can actually compare if they have log going back that far. And for Exchange, it seems that okay. they did. Um, they can actually compare um, uh, someone submitting a token to, let's say, Skype and checking their Azure AD logs to see was that token signed, right? And if there's a mismatch, then that means that it's forged. If someone submitted a token that Microsoft didn't sign themselves and it doesn't appear in their logs, that means that someone else signed it. And if someone else signed it, that means they're using a stolen key. It means they, wasn't, they weren't using Microsoft systems. So Microsoft have actually used that um, as an indicator for 
uh, how to identify which orgs were targeted by this in exchange in the case of exchange nice. so you know we can guess that they have similar logs for going for their own applications for skype and xbox the problems really begin with their customers applications because microsoft doesn't know they don't have uh sign-in logs for their customers' applications. That's something that mm -hmm. customers have to do themselves. They're storing it. They might be storing it in Azure. They might be storing it somewhere else. They might be storing it on-prem. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft can't do that check themselves. That's something that only consumers could do. But consumers, like customers, don't have access to the Azure AD logs. So you know you have Microsoft with these logs and their customers with these logs, but you have to compare them in order to know if you were targeted. And that's, again, only if you have it going back long enough. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like within the scope of what Microsoft can access, like it seems like they can be pretty confident, but they wouldn't have, you know, if you were using Microsoft authentication, like it, it's your own authentication logs. Microsoft doesn't necessarily see those. So that would be where you would have to look. So yeah. thinking about like what, what should organizations do? Do you have any advice for them? Like, I, I don't know, how do you even, I think that's one of the challenges of this is like, this is scary. And I think, again, I, I think Microsoft has probably done all they can to investigate this and they probably are still, but what should organizations be doing in response? So Microsoft did release some indicators of compromise, um, which will be useful. Um, this for, one? Uh, I think it was in the first one in there. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, that one. Yep, so usually, they did usually they're at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's a lot here. Yeah, um, so that's one thing you can use uh, to see if you were targeted. Um, but what we suggested is, first of all, um, a lot of the responsibility here is on organizations running their own applications using Azure AD as their IDP. Like those are the those that's who is in the best position to check if this actor targeted them. Um, end users, there's not much you can do here. Um, because they don't have access to logs, they, they can't really check anything on their end. Um, they might not even know if the threat actor targeted them, if the threat actor Im impersonated them. Mm -hmm. um, so we put in our blog post um, an, Azure, an Azure CLI command uh, for checking if you have applications or you own applications in your cloud environment. Sorry, that was in the... Uh, the July one. Let me just yeah, find so it. This one? It's toward the bottom. And this is, uh, we dropped the link in. This is very detailed, very, very good uh, blog post. So highly recommend. Here's the recommendations, how to detect. Is this the one? Yes. So this lets you basically query your Azure environment to see and then try to answer the question, do you even have any applications that might have been uh, within the attacker's reach? Were they of the type that we mentioned before? Were they mixed audience? Were they, uh, uh, were they even allowing authentication by consumer accounts? Got it. So trying to scope, like narrow down, like rather than, oh gosh, everything that has a Microsoft login, like specific applications. So that's helpful. Yeah. And once you do that, then uh, then you have a, a list of candidates for applications that, again, might have been targeted, but like very low likelihood here because there's no reason for you to think they were targeted, right? Yep. It's just that they were within the attacker's grasp. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we outlined a few things that attackers can, that, uh, sorry, that uh, customers can check for in their logs if they have logs. And this is, again, this is an issue because they might not go back far enough. Sure. Um, and even if they do, they might not uh, be detailed enough. They might not be saving you know, all the metadata for every single authentication going back who knows how long. It's a lot. Um, but if you do have those kind of logs, then we basically uh, gave guidance here on what you should be looking for. Um, and one thing that we, that we pointed out, um, uh, which is sort of entering the realm of, of pure speculation, is that in theory, uh, there are still applications that might be susceptible to this. And mm. there are applications where the key would still have power, which is if you are using a cached version of the trusted key list. Mm -hmm. You should be refreshing it like every day um the keys don't change incredibly often which is actually part of the problem like the key that was stolen was first created i think in 2016 which mm -hmm. is a very long time for a key to exist it expired in 2021 but for some reason microsoft was still trusting it we don't actually know why um, but uh, let's say if you see in your logs someone using the key that that was stolen 
and you can check that by the key ID, then that obviously means that they're, they're using a forged one because Microsoft would no longer be, be using that key to sign anything at this point. Gotcha. So that that key is is should be deactivated right now. But it sounds like if it's cached, is there a way someone can like force key updates? Is that the right term? So that's a, that's a good question. That's that's like on the on the application developer side of the responsibility model. Um, gotcha. Like every app implements this differently. It's possible that if using the SDK, it's a bit more standardized, but you don't have to use the SDK. Mm -hmm. um, so every app would implement this differently. Gotcha. So it might be worth like if organizations, right, they're using this to figure out which applications are affected, looking at, right, how, you know, is it is it possible that that, you know, inactive bad key is still being trusted or not? But Because that would depend on the specific application. Exactly. Interesting. Because, yeah, I'm imagining many organizations like uh, the average org that you know, I've worked with is probably like, oh, my gosh, application logs dating back two years. Like, no way. So it sounds like it's still worth like maybe running this, figuring out applications that could be affected and kind of checking to make sure they're not still trusting that bad key, right? Is there anything else orgs should be doing kind of moving forward if they don't have historic logs? So I will say that, I mean, we keep saying like two years, but that's like the worst case scenario. And yeah. uh, like, I really wish Microsoft would have would have said, would have narrowed the timeline a bit because mm -hmm. most of the activity that they that they observed, at least what they've said publicly was around May. Like mm. that's when this was at actor was a targeting exchange. Sure. Um, there is also something that 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 it that um, that works in exchange exchange's favor is that the mistake that I mentioned earlier, where um, it was trusting uh, the consumer key to sign enterprise uh, enterprise tokens. That actually, uh, based on Microsoft's analysis, uh, that actually only came into play in twenty twenty two. Okay. So that leaves like a shorter time frame, at least for targeting ex exchange uh, enterprise accounts. Gotcha. Um, so it's sort of like possibly back to 2021, like we have evidence back to May, but hopefully it's not quite as long as we as it could be. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but in terms of other things that organizations could be doing, that's in terms of detection, that's pretty much mm -hmm. all we can offer. Um, yeah. The other recommendations we have are mostly for how to make sure or how to lower the chances of this happening to you um, and happening to your customers. Mm -hmm. um, so we did give some advice there uh, in this blog post and in our second blog post about uh, just general advice uh, that we would give to, to cloud customers mm -hmm. um, to lower the chances of this happening, both in terms of sanitizing crash dumps doing a lot of things that Microsoft actually was already doing. They just had some bugs in their systems that prevented it from succeeding. Um, you know, they, they did segment their production environment from their corporate environment, which is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, they were scrubbing their crash dumps. It just didn't work properly. They were checking, they were scanning their, their, their machines for credentials, but it didn't work. Um, so it, it's sort of frustrating because a lot of the advice that we would give is stuff that Microsoft was already doing and it didn't work. Um, but other than that, I would say, make sure that you don't keep crash dumps around, around for too long, mm -hmm. uh, which it does seem that Microsoft was doing. The second thing is don't have keys be valid for so long. Like the fact that this key was valid for like eight years or seven years, mm -hmm. that's a really long time. And it just means that if a key is stolen, then the impact, you know, it, it's, it, it, it lasts a long time. Whereas yeah. if the key was set to expire a month later, then who cares? Gotcha. Just kind of makes the, because I mean, we have to believe that if this happened once, it could happen again. And so next time, if the key is valid for a shorter time frame, the impact wouldn't be as bad, ideally. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think, you know, what I'm struck by is a lot of these recommendations are just different from what this community maybe is traditionally used to. Like we're used to like, cool, have your endpoint tool block the bad thing or, you know, block these IPs. And yeah, there are, you know, I appreciate you pointing out in the Microsoft blog post, which we had linked earlier, worth detecting on those. But a lot of these things are really going to require like thinking about how you're storing your own crash dump data, thinking about how your applications work, the keys you trust. So I think, I think it's important, even if like you aren't versed in this stuff, just to look at this and 
you know, for anyone watching, thinking about how you could apply this in your organization, because the reality is these are not the types of recommendations that are easy for every org to do. But I think they're kind of important because we're seeing adversaries moving to cloud environments. This is a great example of that. And, you know, in terms of detection, like we don't know what did or didn't trigger within Microsoft's corporate network. You know, it's possible that um, this threat actor was using, you know, zero days that that weren't weren't being detected. It's possible they were using tools that weren't being detected. It's possible they were living off the land in such a way that made it very, very hard to detect them. Um, we just don't know. Like I'm guessing Microsoft does, but again, it was like two years ago. Who knows? Yeah. It's Investigation and incident response two years old is is probably not an easy task. All right. Well, we've talked about a lot. I appreciate we kind of closed on what orgs should do. Um, any other kind of key takeaways, thoughts as we kind of close up this this series of thoughts, Amy Tai? Um, so I will say that I mean, one of the the things that came out of this was the the bug in exchange uh, that made. Um, that made the application uh, trust the key in a way that it shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the kind of cases where I say, you know, Microsoft is the one that designed this system. Mm -hmm. And the system relies on developers doing things in a certain way and not making a certain mistake. Yeah. And in this case, um, Microsoft made that mistake themselves. And I, I always like I always think that you know if Microsoft is making a mistake using their own system like the system they developed, then their customers are probably making the same mistake or at least some of them are. Um, and in these cases, I think it's really important to make sure that defaults are secure, and also to make sure that you know I, I think that documentation is important, but it can't be like a security barrier. It mm. can't be. The thing that separates, you know, not making a mistake from making a mistake is people are going to make mistakes, but the system should have warnings in place. It should say, you are about to make a mistake. <laughs> if you need help, then, you know, here's the doc, here's the doc you should be looking at. Um, Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's consistent with, you know, not blaming the users for clicking the link, like having technical controls in addition to te telling developers, here's our standard, have some controls like checks in, are you sure you want to do this? like Clippy for developers, I don't know, something like that. So good advice. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, one last topic. We have a couple minutes left for the top of the hour. Um, I know you and your team do a lot of other research in terms of cloud vulnerabilities, security issues, and you'd mentioned this uh, cloud vuln DB. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this, right? We talked about Storm 558 in this investigation, but Unfortunately, like there's probably a lot of other security concerns issues out there. So could you tell us a little bit about this and how, how this uh, database can be useful? Yeah, like I mean, Storm 0558 is an, is an APT actor. Uh, that probably is a problem for about 1% of organizations, maybe less. Like mo most organizations are are troubled by cybercrime and by by other types of actors. Okay. Um, and, and you know, they, they go for lower, lower hanging fruit. Um, so, I mean, we, we spoke a bit about, about the, the secure defaults a second ago. Um, so CloudVolDB is a database. It's an open source uh, community project that we maintain. Um, it's based on a project that was built by uh, Scott Piper. Um, so he currently works at Wiz, but before he works at Wiz, worked at Wiz, um, uh, he has been known as a, uh, as a cloud security historian. Um, he's one of the type of people that sort of knows Anything and everything about uh, AWS, and you you know you can ask him a question about something, and he's like walking Wikipedia about something that happened like ten years ago. Um, <laughs> so the original version of CloudMongodB was a was a repo that he uh, that he put together, uh, which was a very very detailed uh, documentation of of mistakes made by cloud security providers. And when we say mistakes, we we generally mean vulnerabilities. We mean cases where uh, the 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 defaults weren't secure enough, or cases where a um, an application uh, built by a cloud security provider um, contained a certain bug that allowed anything from uh, you know leaking information uh, to allowing authentication too easily uh, to allowing container escape within the production environment um, to things like cross tenant access. Which is sort of like the holy grail for for cloud vulnerability researchers. It basically means that you sign in as one user and you gain access to another user's data. 
Um, and that is precisely the place where we mentioned before the difference between on-prem and online. That is the place where the online services uh, become dangerous um, because it's actually something that doesn't really exist on-prem because if you're using something on-prem, then you are the only user. Um, you're not sharing your you're not sharing your um, your server with a, with a thousand other users. Um, and a lot of uh, the work done by cloud security providers and um, their customers that are also building apps in the cloud. So there's something you know called uh, lift and shift, which is sort of when you know you, you pick up your your production environment and you just throw it into the cloud as is. It's um, easy, right? It's so easy. Yeah. And uh, when you do that, you know you need you need to take into consideration that the cloud has different physics, and certain vulnerabilities, like for example, a container escape vulnerability, become a lot more impactful when you have a multi-tenant environment. Because again, escaping a container into your own server where you are the only user is sort of meaningless. It's like you get okay, it's like rooting your Android device, right? Um, but if you're sharing your device with a thousand other people, it becomes more significant. So anyway, uh, Cloud MongoDB is a catalog uh, built on that repo uh, that was originally built by Scott Piper. Uh, since then, we've added a bunch of other issues. Um, uh, it's mistakes related to GCP, related to Azure, even Alibaba, um, stuff that's, uh, that's that's probably a bit less common, at least uh, in the West. Nice. And I appreciate you have, here's your criteria, mm -hmm. like actual or proven potential impact on cloud customers. I was like, that one. Um, I see it says with or without assigned CVEs. And I think this is interesting because again, in an on-prem world, a lot of us are like, if there's not a assigned CVE, I don't need to worry. Um, it sounds like, right, as you note here, there aren't CVEs for everything. I think we're all used to like, it's not a vulnerability. It's like, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like, is it less common that there's a CVE for everything in the cloud environment as opposed to a traditional on-prem or how does that work? So it's actually worse than that. I mean, it's it's often they don't, they don't have CVEs. They don't even have a unique identifier. Mm. Um, I think the only one who really gives good unique identifiers, I think is GCP. Like if you go to their security advisories, any security advisory has like a unique identifier. Mm -hmm. um, but most cloud security providers and a lot of SaaS providers as well, when someone finds a vulnerability, whether it's them or uh, an external security researcher, um, it becomes a thing that in order to talk about, um, you need to know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was that was a bad way of putting it. <laughs> no, that. it makes sense. Like, how do we know if we're talking about the same security mistake or vulnerability if we don't yeah, have like an identifier? It's that a bug wider attack problem. As your right? Cosmos DB, right? Yep. Um, and actually, our solution at Wiz has just been to, to give things uh, flashy names, because uh, then everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, Makes sense. It helps us communicate. So yeah, interesting. Uh, awesome. And you're right. I mean, CVEs not existing for these is a problem, because it means that when you're not enumerating something, then all the processes that, as an industry, we have in place for handling stuff like CVEs, they just fall apart, and they don't work for this stuff. Um, and one of the claims behind not having CVEs for these is that often there is no customer action required. So mm. the CVE, if it existed, would, would be more for like historical purposes to, to learn about what happened here. And But the thing is that I have two things to say to that. One is that often that isn't the case. Um, sometimes there is customer action required. For example, um, it's possible that from this moment forward, the bug is fixed, but everybody who created, for example, a workload um, still has to reboot their workload for the for the patch to take effect, for example. Um, and the second thing is that having a CVE makes it easier to study these things and not make the same mistakes. And my favorite example is that of this is that I believe Project Zero discovered a vulnerability in Cloud Shell um, in I think it was Azure um, about two years ago. And then a year later, the exact same vulnerability was discovered in a similar product, I think, in AWS. Meaning that, you know, if the if we had a CVE, I believe, I like to believe that it would have been easier to make sure that that would have been discovered earlier. Because mm -hmm. in theory, if you had threat actors that were aware of the first vulnerability, they had a window of about a year to test it out and see if it worked in, in the other cloud security providers, and it would have been a zero day. Yeah. That's, it's interesting to just think about the differences again between the on-prem world and the cloud world. And 
it sounds like we as a community just have a lot of a lot of maturing to do, right? And how do we track this? So um, I, I wasn't familiar with this uh, vulnerability database, so I'm definitely something I'm going to check out. Um, you know, I think it's it's progress in the right direction, right? Getting people on the same page, right? Being aware, and yeah, even if you know, I, th I think that that shared responsibility model makes it tougher. Like, is there anything I can do? No, but I don't know. I think it's still helpful to know if there is a vulnerability and thinking about maybe you do have creative detection or response ideas. So um, I think that a sign of maturing in this area that we as a community, I think, have to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty simple website. Like, it's not, I try to keep it uh, not overly complicated. There aren't like a million fields that people have to fill out. Uh, yeah. Like, there are a lot, but not, not a million. Um, you know, nice. it, it basically hosted on GitHub. Uh, you submit a, a request, and then um, usually within a few days or a few weeks, uh, we'll get to it and, and add it in. Um, it does help when people submit PRs and not just requests, because then it makes yeah. it easier for us to to just approve them. Um, yep. Yep. Anyway, so this is a, it's, I think it's a cool project. All the artwork is uh, is made in uh, Mid Journey, uh, which is like a that's like a hobby of mine. And you know, while I'm working, I just let Mid Journey. Uh, Take our all our all our cool names for vulnerabilities and all the cool names that other vendors use for vulnerabilities and just see what they come up, see what Midjourney comes up with. I like it. You need a good graphic. That's that's key. Helps us communicate. So yeah, yeah. info on how to contribute. PR is appreciated, right? Um, so this is great. If you were a cloud researcher, like definitely check this out. Um, and for the rest of us who are not, just being aware and what new vulnerabilities and security risks are discovered, I think it's really helpful for that as well. So awesome. Well, we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, Emitai, any last thoughts as we start to wrap up here? Uh, I had fun. Yes, have fun in this realm of cloud. Well, again, Emitai, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Y'all be sure to follow Emitai on Twitter as well as the Wiz team. They produce great, great research. Um, we dropped links to all of the blog posts we talked about in those comments. You can check those out there. And with that, thank you all so much for joining this month's star live stream. We hope to see you in a future month. And until then, take care.